her lungs have also started filling with stomach acid, stomach contents, blood and fluid. There's really nothing else we can do. Um, so we went off and turned her machine off. But we accept that this is uh, the fact of life, that some people will go on to take illegal substances. It's a, po it's a poison, it's always dangerous. There's, there is no safe way of taking mind-altering drugs. Festivals are what we call a high-risk environment. If you wanted to think of the worst possible place possible to take an illegal drug, it's probably a festival. Drug checking, the act of testing drugs for purity and contaminants, is new to the UK. It was brought to the UK festival scene in 2016 by a charity called The Loop. But worldwide, it has been around for a lot longer, even dating back to the Summer of Love, 1967 in California, where there were sometimes tainted batches of LSD. And since the 90s, it's been happening throughout Europe. My question is, is this a reasonable, pragmatic approach to drug use, or does it risk making dangerous drugs seem safe? In order to get a better understanding of the issue, I need to see it up close and personal. But it's December, and there aren't many festivals going on at this time of year. So I'm heading up to Durham, see Fiona Misham who works for The Loop. The Loop are organising a day of testing in Durham city centre, so hopefully I'll find out a bit more about the issue. Yeah, so the main concern would be that we are encouraging illegal drug use and we're very clear that we don't. We say that to the service users that we're not encouraging or condoning drug use. We tell every service user that the safest way to take drugs is not to take them at all. Um, but we accept that this is uh, the fact of life, that some people will go on to take illegal substances. Uh, and the people who use our service have already bought the drugs, they've already uh, brought them in to be tested, and the likelihood is that they were going to go on and, and take them. And therefore what we're saying to them is, hold on a minute, please test these substances, you've got no idea what's in them, uh, and we can provide uh, harm reduction advice, and also we can flag up the risks. So for about 15% of people, the drug isn't what they thought, and then they don't go on to take that drug. We find from our service that over two thirds of people who haven't got what they thought they got, then hand it over and they don't take it themselves. Georgia Milburn died at the Mutiny Festival in 2018 after taking two high-dose MDMA pills. I met up with her mum Janine, who has since become a drug education activist. We went back to the field where the festival took place. How do you feel about the practice of, of this drug safety testing? I think it's good. If there's a way of preventing more deaths, then we should be using it. Um, the drug dealers at the moment hold everything in their courts. Why should they get away with murdering people, making people sick when there is a way of helping to stop it, I suppose. Can you tell me a bit about the day? They were getting picked up at midday, which they did. Um, went out, waved them off, said what I always do, be good, be careful, love you, see you both later. And I got a phone call at about half past four from her sister saying, my mum, Georgia's fitting. Uh, the paramedics are with her. And we got here just as Georgia was being loaded in the ambulance. Um, all I saw was her feet going um, and her sister stood there crying. After about 20 minutes, I had the consultant come out. He asked me if I knew exactly what she'd taken. Um, all we knew was two pills. Her heart had stopped a couple of times, getting harder to restart. And he explained to me um, what had happened was she'd taken the pills. Um, it had caused her to go in and out of consciousness and pass out, which is when the fitting started due to extreme high temperature. Um, at one point, it didn't even register. It had gone that high. Um, she was fitting for nearly 50 minutes and the body can only take so much and with her the body started to break down and it does that by um, dissolving your muscle and as the muscle dissolves it causes the blood to turn acidic um, which then obviously affects every single organ of the body anyway he went off and told me it's sort of it's serious you need to get people down here okay i thought a few days in hospital okay we can deal with that came back again and said, look, she's, her heart stopped again another couple of times. It's getting harder each time. Um, I'm honestly trying everything I can, but it is getting to the point of no return now. 
Um, everyone turned up family wise and he came in a couple of minutes after and said um, unfortunately now her heart has stopped again but her lungs have also started filling with stomach acid, stomach contents, blood and fluid. There's really nothing else we can do. Um, so we went off and turned her machine off. Um, she died at 20 past eight. Left speechless after the story of George's death, I had to find out why some people are against drug safety testing. Author and journalist Peter Hitchens has spoken out against it before. When he came to Winchester to promote a book, I arranged to sit down with him. Do you think there's any value in sort of a pragmatic approach that realistically people at music festivals are going to use drugs? Well, if they're going to use drugs, then realistically they should expect to be arrested and prosecuted for breaking the law. And the police should arrest them, arrest them and the Crown Prosecution Service should prosecute them. If you break the law, that's what happens. If I, if I reached across the table and punched you on the nose in front of a camera, uh, you could call the police and have me prosecuted because I would have broken the law. So why shouldn't the same apply for someone who, 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 who buys a, a drug which it is a serious crime to possess? I'm against people in authority undermining the law which they're paid to uphold. The police are sworn. To become a police officer, you swear an oath to uphold the law without fear or favour. And that means upholding it. It does not mean compromising it and saying, this law I can't be bothered to enforce, or this law I will look the other way about. All the law you have to enforce it. That's your job. And anybody else in society governed by law who undermines the, the law of the land is effectively betraying uh, their own society and, and betraying civilization. Do not pretend that there is any, that you increase the safety or the security of anybody by making it easier to sell drugs at festivals, which is what uh, this testing does, or, uh, or, or making the, the whole idea of, of taking illegal drugs more acceptable. What do you do, well, what do you do when you do safer, that? Not well, it's not safer, it's, safer. it's not, it's not it, safer, it's not safer. What it is, rather than and it's always dangerous. Some sort of, uh, it's, a po it's a poison, it's always dangerous. There's, there is no safe way of taking mind-altering drugs. But By their no, nature, there is no there, more safe. No, there is no, taking something there is no, there is no safe way, and they are illegal. So to promote the taking of them, or to suggest that the taking of an illegal, unsafe drug is in any way safer, is a wicked act. If the person who you persuade to buy and take a drug by doing this then develops lifelong mental illness, that's on your conscience. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wouldn't well, want to. I wouldn't want to have that on my conscience if they die, myself. If they die from I'm not talking about dying. rat poison or something like that, which is in the drugs, which they would have found out had they tested them. No, the simple, the simple, rule, the, the simple rule with illegal drugs is they're illegal. Don't buy them, don't take them. That's what the law is for, it's to warn you. It's the, that's, that's what the purpose of the law is, is to warn people away from doing stupid, irresponsible things, so, which, will damage, them, which will damage themselves and ruin the lives of their family. People I've spoken to so far have fallen on one side of the issue or the other. Sometimes, as with Janine, after going through serious personal pain caused by drugs. So I've made my way to Liverpool, a city rich with history, culture and music, and also home to Harry Sumner. Harry has advised the government on drug policy, and I think he's the man to give us an evidence-based, unbiased view. My name's Harry Sumnall. My formal title is Professor in Substance Use. I've been researching drugs and substance use for about 20 years. The drug checking has been rolled out at quite a few festivals over the years and a few city centres. Yeah. Supporters of it say it gives people at festivals who some uh, will inevitably use drugs the choice to check what's in them and the strength of them. My view is that drug checking is an important component of our overall responses to drugs. Uh, but I think it's important to be very realistic about the potential impact and what sort of effects that we expect from introducing these sorts of drug checking systems. Drug checking at festivals has been around since 2016. Uh, well, in the UK. In the UK I know, yeah. I know in, yeah. in Holland, yeah. I believe, it's been around for longer. Yeah. Um, has there been any, any reliable statistics produced uh, so, so of its, to prove its effectiveness? I think it's fair to say that the research is in its infancy. 
not just in the UK but internationally, which is quite surprising considering how long that these systems have been running uh, in Europe, for example. So one of the problems with researching this sort of intervention is, is firstly deciding on what you think would be a successful outcome. Some of the work that Professor Fiona Misham has done, for example, at a festival, and this was research published late last year, looked at the proportion of individuals at one festival in England who disposed of their drugs. And uh, it was around about a quarter of individuals, uh, but it was a higher proportion in those people who'd received uh, information that their, their drugs contained something which they didn't expect. So that's a good outcome but it needs to be expanded and repeated and it also needs to be independently verified as well using different research techniques. But I think, you know, uh, overall of the big questions, does it reduce harms? We don't know at the moment. If there's a tragedy at a festival in a nightclub, then a lot of the immediate response to that is, you know, that that life would have been saved if there'd been drug checking there. We don't actually know whether it does have those sorts of impacts. I've spoken to a few critics who have said that drug checking could make people think that taking drugs is safer and therefore it's more alluring than, than if they see it as more of an unknown and an unsafe thing to do. How do you feel about that? I don't think that uh, drug checking normalises drug use. Uh, I think it normalises taking an approach where we show to people who use drugs that we actually care about their well-being and safety. And it may also normalise an attitude within people who use drugs themselves that they really need to think about their own safety and what they can potentially do to reduce the harms associated with use. So there's no evidence to support the claim that drug checking reduces harm. Another talked about method of harm reduction is education. In a way, accepting people will use drugs, but trying to get them to do so wisely. What's it called? Don't go with the flow. Can you, can you explain <laughs> what, what it's about? Um, George's name at home was always Flo, um, so I thought the two went together quite well. Um, I don't want people to follow in her footsteps. Um, and I think that everyone should have drug education, and that's the main root of it all. If people know how to take things properly, what's actually in these things, um, the whole story around drugs, then they can make informed choices, they can decide if it is what they actually want to do, rather than listening from their mates that so-and-so down the road took 10 pills or the other one took 15 pills. They believe that's how you take it. Um, in George's case, she took two pills, as far as we know, together. And ultimately, that's what killed her, is not having that knowledge. Um, People can bury their heads in the sand all they like, but just say no hasn't worked for years, never did. Um, so the only way to tackle it is to give them the proper information. I spoke to uh, a lady called Janine Milburn, whose daughter Georgia died last year at a festival called Mutiny mm. uh, in Portsmouth. Yeah. Uh, she died from a high dose pill. Mm. She started a campaign for, uh, to sort of reform drug education. Do you think there's room for improvement in that area? There's different ways of looking at drug education and prevention. Some of it is more targeted at harm reduction behaviours. So a good drug education message would be to, if you're taking an ecstasy tablet, first of all be mindful that it might not contain what you think it does. And because there's high strength harmfully high strength uh, tablets around to take a half or even a quarter. So that, that's good pragmatic drug education information. So I'm all in favour of education and prevention, but we need to be very clear about what sort of outcomes we expect and what sort of behaviours we should expect. So if we're talking now, for example, and if we're, we're talking about activities and things you could put in place to reduce your future level of drug-related harm, and that's fine, we can both agree that, that they would be really good things to do and you could make, for example, a commitment that you're going to not mix your drugs or that you're going to reduce your dose or when it's three o'clock in the morning you're not suddenly going to accept an unknown white powder off a friend or an acquaintance. Now that's great, you know, we can rationalise that. But when you're actually in an environment where 
for example, you've been up all night, you're already intoxicated or drunk, how well can you actually recall that sensible information and act upon it? We become more impulsive. We start to act on the moment. If we consider a, a festival, for example, a weekend festival, so two or three days of hedonism, people partying, enjoying themselves, many people taking more drugs than they would do usually, many people taking drugs for the first time, many people being exposed to drugs uh, that they're un where they're unfamiliar with the effects. And because, of, of course, we're talking about an illegal market, the drugs market, there's no quality control, there's no dose control there. So festivals are what we call a high-risk environment. If you wanted to think of the worst possible place possible to take an illegal drug, it's probably a festival. So I've been up and down the country. I've talked to people on both sides of the argument, and even a professor who specialises in drugs. And so far, there's no evidence on either side. But one thing we do know is that the UK has one of the highest drug death rates in Europe and with 3,756 people dying from drugs in 2017, surely change is needed somewhere.